So the last thing we need to talk about is assimilation. Now, remember I said absorption is when the nutrients move through wherever they were into the bloodstream. So in the small intestine, we had the nutrients that were absorbed into the bloodstream and those nutrients were the monomers of the food groups. And in the large intestine, we had water that was absorbed into the bloodstream. Okay, now what happens to the water and the glucose and the, the amino acids and the glycerol, etc.? What happens to all those things? We know that we need them. We need them for a reason. We need glucose, for example, for cellular respiration. We need amino acids for our muscles um, to grow nice and strong, to be nice and strong, okay, to make up our muscle. So we need those things for certain reasons. When we use up those things for whatever purposes they are made or made for, that is assimilation. So when I, for example, use up the glucose that I have absorbed for cellular respiration to take place, that means I'm assimilating glucose. Okay, I did explain this definition in the first video that I did. So when we look at assimilation, we just need the reminder. So I'm just reminding you one more time. Carbohydrates are broken down into glucose. Glucose is the simplest form, the monomer of a carbohydrate. Proteins are broken down into amino acids and lipids are broken into fatty acids and glycerol. So remember when I talk about the monomers, the nutrients that are absorbed, those are the nutrients. Things in red are the nutrients that are being absorbed. So those nutrients, those monomers, we know that they are absorbed into the bloodstream and I told you that they need to go and be checked at customs first. They need to travel to the liver before they can travel to the heart. And so they travel in what is called the hepatic portal vein. Okay, now just look at this quickly. Here is, here is the liver, right? This organ over here is called the liver. The liver has what's called a hepatic vein. Remember, a vein travels to the heart. So, and hepatic means liver. Okay, so the same way every vein and every artery has a name, the vein that is traveling away from the liver is called the hepatic vein, the liver vein, essentially. So the hepatic vein is going to take um, the blood from the liver back to the heart. Then we have um, our stomach. Here's our stomach leading into our small intestine and then leading into our large intestine here. They've cut off the large intestine. Okay. Whatever is digested in our, our stomach and in our small intestine, um, we do not pass that straight to the heart. We pass it to the liver first. So it travels in what is called the hepatic portal vein to the liver where it is then filtered, where it is then sent via the hepatic vein to the heart. That is your hepatic portal system. So essentially the hepatic portal system is all those nutrients that were broken down, those monomers, are sent to the liver and from the liver sent to the heart. So if you look in our stomach, we said that we had some absorption of alcohols and poisons, toxic substances. Those that are absorbed, those substances that are absorbed, travel to the liver first. In the pancreas, we well, not in the pancreas, the pancreas also secreted insulin and glucagon. Those are hormones that we're going to talk about just now in this lesson. Those hormones also travel to the liver. And then in the small intestine, we broke down um, carbohydrates into glucose and we broke down um, proteins into amino acids. Those also travel to the liver. And then in the spleen, this is just a side note, this is not important over here, but the spleen, we um, break down red blood cells, so we have dead blood, red blood cells that also pass to the liver. What is important here is mostly the fact that glucose and amino acids 
and the alcohols and the toxins and the poisons and the hormones all travel to the liver first. That is your hepatic portal system. So when we look at what happens to those monomers, if we look at first at carbohydrates, okay, so we know that carbohydrates we use for cellular respiration. Glucose we use for cellular respiration, okay. Now, guys, how does someone, and, and I, I don't, I'm not doing any body shaming here, but how does someone become obese? Versus how does someone become skinny, malinx, anorexic? Okay, besides, let's not go into bulimia and vomiting and all this. Let's just talk about diet-wise. How does someone lose weight and how does someone gain weight to become obese? It is by their glucose intake, all right? So your glucose is what gives you, remember, we use glucose for cellular respiration. So we use glucose to make energy. Now, if you need a certain amount of energy to do your metabolic processes, which you'll re remember I spoke about when we um, learned about cellular respiration, but when we need X amount, if I have, and I don't want to do maths, I hate maths, but let's just say I need X amount of glucose for cellular respiration to occur. If I have 5X, then I have five times more glucose than I need. That glucose is excess glucose. It's going to be stored and it's going to essentially make me fat, okay? It's going to be stored and then eventually be stored as fat and I'm going to put on weight, all right? If I only have half X, so I have X divided by two, the then I'm not, I do not have enough glucose to do my beta metabolic processes, which means I'm going to be tired all the time and essentially maybe anemic and um, fatigued and l like lethargic all the time. Okay, but we're not going into that. We are only going into excess glucose. So you need a certain amount of energy to do your daily metabolic processes and you are, let's say, for example, especially the people that are very active usually during the sports season, those people who are usually active during sports season, now during lockdown, they haven't been doing their sports. If they haven't gone out and exercised in the garden and run around and done whatever, they are not burning as much glucose as what they usually did. And so they are, and that's what's happened to a lot of people, um, put on weight in this lockdown period, okay, because of excess glucose, because I'm not using my full glucose intake, I'm not expending it, okay, I, I have extra left. I kind of wish glucose worked like money, or I wish money worked like glucose. It would be great if I had some left at the end of the month, that would be fabulous. Anyway. So, we haven't used all the glucose that we have made, so we have excess glucose. That glucose, remember, um, it's go, it travels to the liver, right, via the hepatic portal system. So, it travels to the liver. In the liver, it gets stored as what is called glycogen. Please, I'm going to do the words with you, but glycogen literally means stored glucose. So remember in a potato, in, in any kind of carbohydrate, the glucose stores as starch. So in plants, glucose stores as starch. In animals, glucose stores as glycogen. Glycogen is stored glucose. So in the liver, any excess glucose we have is going to store as glycogen. Now, the liver can only withhold a certain amount of glycogen so think of the liver as a silo okay it can only um, take as much glycogen as its capacity and when it's at full capacity its store is full it cannot take anymore what it does when it cannot take anymore when its stores are full 
is it converts any additional glycogen as um, fatty acids and glycerol. And that fatty acids and glycerol that it then stores goes into your adipose tissue. Now, remember adipose tissue, you did in grade 10 as well, fat tissue. And essentially then becomes a fat deposit, which means we put on weight. So the people that are putting on weight, it's because they've got so much glucose in excess that not only is their liver completely full of glycogen, they also now have additional to that so it goes and stores in their um, fat cells. Um, an interesting thing to note, I don't know if your generation knows even what I'm talking about if I talk about Survivor or some of you will know and some of you won't, um, but when I was younger I watched lots and lots and lots of Survivor. It still exists so you should know what I'm talking about. Um, but either talk about Survivor or on the other hand, let's like I'll, I'll talk about Bear Girls if you know who that is. Anybody that goes on Survivor, they go at whatever weight they were, okay? Or when Bear Girls goes into the jungle, he goes at whatever weight he was, okay? If that person or survives Survivor till pretty much here at the end, if you've watched a reunion episode of Survivor, they always look amazing. They've lost so much weight by the end of Survivor. And that is because when they go into Survivor, they go with their body weight and their fat deposits that they have in the adipose tissue. Whatever glucose they are getting in is less than they need, right? They Because they're still doing physical activity and, and metabolic processes, they are getting in less glucose than they actually need. And so if, if they've gone in, let's say they've gone in at a certain weight, their liver, their glycogen stores in their liver is full, and they have adipose tissue deposits, so they have fat. Everybody has some fat. Um, when they do not have enough glucose, so they're eating rice every day, because that's not enough energy, that they need for metabolic processes. The glycogen in their, or first of all, the fat in their adipose tissue will be converted to glycogen. That glycogen will be used up. So basically think of the liver, think of this full silo of glycogen. If I don't have enough glucose, I'm going to convert that glycogen back into glucose so that I can use that glucose up, okay? Then, eventually, if I've depleted that, that silo, that amount of glycogen, then I can convert the fat back into glycogen, convert the glycogen back into glucose, and use that for cellular respiration. So, effectively, we're burning off that fat by converting it back to glycogen and back to glucose, and then using it for cellular respiration. So, they are burning off their fat because they're using that fat store now as glucose for energy or for the, the cellular respiration that they need for energy to take uh, to do their metabolic processes. And that is how weight loss works. Okay, I think I've said enough about that. Okay, so that was what happens with carbohydrates. Let's look at what happens to fats, lipids. You know that lipids, fats, are important um, components of cell membranes. You learned that in grade 10 as well. Um, your cell membranes contain um, phospholipids, remember? And so the word lipid tells me that there's fat in the cell membrane. That's the first thing. The other thing is, hello, um, it's winter, we're all cold. Our extra fat layer helps us a lot, okay? We want to, we don't mind a few extra kilograms in the winter because as long as we have some extra fat, some extra um kilograms during winter we have some extra insulation we are kept warmer right so insulation is a nice um, function of lipids and fats so we use lipids and fats for insulation and the last thing is for protection guys even someone who is skinny as a rake still has some fat those fat deposits just aren't found in the areas where it's noticeable, that fat then is found around their organs because our organs are protected by fats. So those are where, or those are the things that we 
when we assimilate fats, that is what we assimilate them for. Okay. Um, and then when we look at proteins, the function of protein is growth. Okay, so we use um, um, proteins to grow. Remember, our muscles are made up of protein. We also repair our tissue. So we get a cut or a scrape. For those cells to repair themselves, we use protein, amino acids. Also, proteins, uh, hormones are made up of proteins and enzymes are proteins. Um, so we use proteins for enzyme production and for hormones. Okay. We cannot store a protein. So we cannot have excess protein in our bodies. So we, de we do what's called deamination. We deaminate proteins into ammonia. Now, ammonia is toxic for our body. So ammo when we deaminate, now the liver is what de where deamination takes place. In the liver, there's detoxification and deamination. Deamination says I turn a protein into ammonia. But because that ammonia is toxic for my body, that ammonia then mixes with, um, bonds with carbon dioxide to form what is called urea. And urea we excrete. Now, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but when we do the excretory system, the kidney, um, remember I said at the beginning in the first lesson, excretion talks about urine, peeing. When we excrete, there is urine, um, there is urea in our urine that is made up of ammonia and carbon dioxide. So it comes from excess protein. Um, and that is what I need you to know mostly on assimilation. So if we look at just some functions of the liver quickly. We know already that the liver produces bile. Remember, the liver is where the bile is produced and then that bile stores in the gallbladder. Okay, so function of the liver produces bile. What does bile do? It emulsifies fats. What does emulsify mean? It breaks it down Okay, into a um, liquid form, into a um, digested form. Think of Scott's emulsion. It is an emulsified, it is a liquidized fat solution. Um, so bile emulsifies fats. That is very, very important to know the function of bile, emulsify fats. Um, bile also neutralizes acid. Okay, that's the first function of the liver. The second function of the liver is what we've spoken about previously. The fact that the liver converts glucose into glycogen. The next thing is that it converts toxic ammonia into urea. That is called um, deamination. The liver is also responsible for the production of vitamin A. It also stores vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, and vitamin B12. Um, remember I said it converts toxic ammonia into urea. Where does that ammonia come from? It comes from the deamination of amino acids. So when the liver deaminates proteins, deaminates amino acids, the production, what it makes is glucose and urea. It actually makes glucose and ammonia. That ammonia combines with carbon dioxide to produce urea okay and lastly the last function is detoxification neutralizes poisonous substances it's the same thing okay it gets rid of toxins detoxification right and then the last bit now we have done digestion we have spoken about how we derive at the monomers. We have then spoken about how we absorb those monomers into our bloodstream. 
we've spoken about when they are in the bloodstream, how they get to the heart. From the heart, they are pumped to the different organs to be used. We've spoken about them being used, them being assimilated, what they are used for. That means we are done talking about digestion and absorption as a whole. Now we have to look at homeostasis. And homeostasis, if you recall, I spoke about it before. I said to you that it's quite an important chapter. Actually, it's very, well, not chapter. It's not a chapter on its own, but a topic within a chapter. Because you do this again in matric. And homeostasis has everything to do with balance, control, and maintaining that internal balance. In this case, or in most, in, in the case of the endocrine system, homeostasis has to do with hormones, okay, managing hormones, right? It's not only always the hormones, like we also do temperature control, for example, okay? But in the case of the digestive system, we did have the production of hormones. We had the production, remember when we spoke about the pancreas? We spoke about the dual function, the exocrine and the endocrine function. And we spoke about the pancreas producing the hormones, um, insulin and glucagon. Now we need to talk about how we balance those hormones. That is homeostasis. And that is not the only homeostasis. That is homeostasis of specifically inside happening inside the digestive system and what it is going to maintain in this case is blood sugar levels okay all of us have to have a certain amount of glucose however some of us have too much glucose how do we get our glucose levels in our blood down okay remember this has nothing to do with obesity we've um it's going to yes we've spoken about the liver and how we store fats and and whatnot your, the amount of glucose in your blood isn't what makes you fat. The amount of glucose that ends up in your liver that then gets stored into adipose, in, in your adipose tissue, that's what makes you fat, okay? And that is going to happen by means of homeostasis because we, we only want X amount of glucose in our blood. If we have too much, what are we going to do to get rid of it? If we have too little, how are we going to get more? Okay, so when we look at that, we, we are balancing our blood glucose levels. In other words, the amount of glucose in our blood. Right. Um, when you have eaten a meal, so just after you've eaten, you are going to digest that food. When you digest that food, you are breaking it down into its monomers, your glucose levels after a meal are going to increase, okay? Whether you have eaten too much or, or the normal amount, you're going to increase your glucose levels, okay? When your group glucose levels increase, it's going to stimulate the um, production of the hormone insulin. That insulin is going to... Um, Stim, uh, is, uh, is going to stimulate the conversion of glucose into glycogen. Remember, if your levels are higher than they normally are, you need to store some of that glucose. You don't want, you're trying to get rid of it in the blood, so you're going to store it as glycogen. Okay, so insulin is involved where glucose levels are high or too high. And insulin is going to stimulate the, or the, the conversion of glucose into glycogen. On the other hand, when you do not have enough glucose in your blood, so your blood sugar levels drop, and people with diabetes will know about this a lot. When your blood sugar levels drop, you don't have enough glucose. We need to increase those glucose levels in the blood. What will happen then is that the hormone glucagon, and now remember we spoke about glycogen, and now we're talking about glucagon. Glycogen is stored glucose. 
glucagon is a hormone. Anyway, so the glucagon is the hormone that is going to increase the amount of glucose in our blood. And how it does that is that, remember the silo I spoke about? If the silo is full of glycogen, it's going to, glucagon is going to be the hormone responsible for saying, hey, glycogen, you need to turn into glucose now. So I spoke about the survivors and the people that lose weight. Their glycogen stores will then be depleted because the glycogen will be converted back into glucose so that there's more glucose in the blood. All right. Essentially then, we'll start over here. Okay. We either have, so homeostasis says we have normal glucose, right? Glucose levels. If we have our blood glucose levels increasing, we need to know, and listen here, you should be able to bullet point the steps. If my blood glucose levels increase, the first thing that's going to happen is that the beta cells, beta cells, and you must know that, beta cells, and it's like a funny little bee, you've seen it before, okay? Um, the beta cells in the pancreas, in, now I want you to listen to me, it's not, it's not here. In the pancreas, there are these little cells called the islets of Langerhans. I'm going to just say it again and then I'll spell it. Islets of Langerhans. Those are cells of the pancreas, okay? It's capital I S L E T S of Langerhans, capital L A N G E R H A N S. This will be in your textbook, okay? Inside these islets of Langerhans, these cells of the pancreas, they are beta cells. Those beta cells produce insulin. That insulin will then be released into the bloodstream and it will stimulate the liver to convert glucose into glycogen. Okay, so I want you, all of you, and you can't see me, I know that, but I want you to put your hands out like, you know that lady on the emojis that goes, why? Like, um like a scale, two arms that are sticking out, asking why. I hope that you kind of get that. Or imagine a scale, right? If if your two hands are lined up with your shoulders or whatever, then you have this scale. And I will do this in the revision lesson. Um, you have a scale. If everything is equal, then your hands are equal. But now on one hand, or now, or now when you have an increase in glucose, then your scale is tipped. So let's pretend your right arm is the one that had glucose. Now put it higher, put it up towards the ceiling and keep your other one low. Think of a seesaw, right? Your one end of the seesaw goes up and the other end of the seesaw is down, right? So glucose is high. To be able to bring that, you either have glucose or glycogen, right? So if your glucose is high, then your glycogen is low. So to be able to bring glucose back down, we need to increase glycogen. Okay, so think of your seesaw again, right? The glucose is going to come down again to balance. To be able to balance your seesaw, that means your glycogen came up. And then you, at the point where they meet again, when they the seesaw is balanced, then you've got homeostasis, okay? So in other words, glucose was stored as glycogen. Therefore, I minus glucose, but I plused glycogen. And that is the function of insulin. So when that glucose is stored as glycogen, it's bringing the glucose levels down in the blood. And so we, when we've got that balanced seesaw, we've got maintain, maintenance of homeostasis. So if I had to set that out in bullet form, I would say one, blood glucose levels rise. Two, 
Beta cells in islets of Langerhans in pancreas secrete insulin. Three, insulin stimulates the conversion of glucose into glycogen. Four, blood glucose levels decrease. Five, homeostasis is maintained. Okay, on the other hand, I want you again to make your seesaw. Write two hands that are at the same level. One is glucose, one is glycogen. If your glucose levels drop, so let's do right hand again and put it lower than the other hand. If your glucose levels drop, we need more glucose and less glycogen to be able to balance. Therefore, the islet, the, the alpha cells, sorry, this in this case alpha cells, in the islets of Langerhans, in the pancreas, stimulate the release of the hormone glucagon. And the function of glucagon is to break down glycogen and convert it back into glucose. So now think of your little tip seesaw. You've got glucose down here and you've got glycogen up there, right? Glycogen needs to come down so that glucose can come up. So we're going to have glucagon, the hormone, that causes glycogen to break down, minus, come down. And when glycogen is broken down, it is made, it is turned into glucose. So glucose goes up. And so imagine your little tip seesaw. If glycogen comes down and glucose comes up, then I've got a seesaw that matches again. I've got this balance of homeostasis. And so then I'm going to maintain homeostasis. Okay, so if we just go over that one again, if my blood glucose levels drop, then the alpha cells of the islets of Langerhans of the pancreas stimulate the release of the hormone glucagon. Glucagon stimulates the conversion of glycogen into glucose, therefore increasing the glucose levels in the blood therefore maintaining homeostasis okay um i hope this makes sense you can also visit this topic or this little section in your textbooks um i hope i don't conf i didn't confuse you now with my seesaw thing but essentially um i find the seesaw thing to be the most easy way to explain it um but you have to understand what I explained initially about storing glucose as glycogen and then breaking down glycogen into glucose to be able to understand this. So if we look at this very quickly, when we spoke about weight loss and weight gain, the person whose blood glucose levels rose, increased, who made insulin and stored that glucose as glycogen, that glycogen, remember, when the silos are full, eventually it's going to store as fat. So insulin is technically the hormone involved with making you fat, obesity, all right? Whereas the person whose blood glucose levels falls is going to stimulate or is going to release the hormone glucagon so that the glycogen stores are broken down, so that they releasing glucose so that they get enough glucose so essentially those people are the people that are losing weight because their stores their silos are being depleted All right um then just to go over this again very quickly remember glucose is the monomer of carbohydrates All right we haven't spoken about oh we have spoken about this glycerol is the monomer of lipids Glycogen is the stored form of glucose. Glucagon is the hormone released um, by the pancreas that is going to essentially increase blood glucose levels. Right, grade 11s, that is that um, for this topic. I look forward to your questions. Um, I'm not going to do a quiz um, for the reason that you are starting school on Monday 
and I've explained in my long ass voice note what is going to be happening. So when we get there, we will cover the necessary questions um, in our revision of nutrition. That, however, does not mean that you mustn't make sure that you that you don't that you understand this topic. I need you already. If there was something in this video or any video that I've done so far that doesn't make sense to you, you should have taken the initiative to ask. It is very scary to me, having made my voice note today, um, that some of you congratulated me on my pregnancy. Because that means that you didn't watch my previous, I don't know which video, in which I told you I was pregnant, which is very scary for me. Um, but we've had this conversation and I've told you what I've expected of you, so um, your life is going to be difficult, not mine. Right, thank you Grady Levens for um, participating and I'll hear from you soon.